Hello, I'm Dr. Hagop Kantarjian from the Leukemia Department at MD Anderson, and it's my great pleasure to interview Dr. Nitin Jain, who's uh, today recognized as one of the world experts in chronic, myeloid, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, Nitin has uh, chaired and uh, piloted many of the most innovative studies in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and I would like to uh, discuss some of those with him. So, Nitin, um, I always read the CLL literature, and in the textbook, CLL is still considered a disease which is not curable except with allogeneic stem cell transplant. With the discoveries that we have today, is this still a true statement? No, I would say that I think the field, that was true maybe some years ago, but now we know there are other modalities which we can use, which have shown patients to be cured of CLL. Uh, potentially, you know, one approach which was pioneered some years ago at our institution with Dr. Michael Keating with the FCR regimen, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, as you know, in the mutated IGHV patients, young patients, you know, about maybe 40, 45 percent of the patients are living in remission 10, 15 plus years. So I think you can argue that maybe those subset of patients are cured of, uh, of CLL. I think allergenic central transplant is potentially curable, but we hardly these days Use, uh, use that for patients. So I think it has really fallen out of favor and obviously with the complications of allergenic transplant and whatnot. So I think, I think there's a group of patients certainly can be cured with the current available therapies we have for CLF. But that's a small minority of patients. They have to be young, immunoglobulin heavy chain mutated um, and negative for uh, TP53 right. and uh, 17 B minus. So that could be maybe 20% of the patients. Do we have something for the 80% of the patients who are not candidates for uh, the fludarabine cyclophosphamide rituximab? Yeah, I think that's, that's where I think the new drugs which have come up a lot in the last 10 years, uh, so namely B, uh, BTK inhibitors, so we have you know, multiple BTK inhibitors approved. Uh, first generation was ibrutinib, second generation is acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib, and now we have a third generation or non-covalent inhibitor, pirtobrutinib, which is approved. Uh, we have a BCL2 inhibitor, Rinderclax, which is, but there are other ones coming along, which is approved. And then, we, you know, we used to have rituximab, but now we have obinutuzumab, which in CLL studies have shown to be superior to rituximab. So these three classes of drugs, BTK, BCL2, and CD20 antibody, which are now being tested in lots of phase one, phase two, phase three studies, combinations, I think has the potential, I think, of curing um, of some of the patients. Now, we don't know which fraction that would be, whether that's going to be 20% of patients who get these drugs are 50%, but at least the early signals are looking promising in the depth of depth of remission we're achieving. So we hope that five, 10 years, or maybe when we have longer follow-up, some of the studies we did early on, we have about five to six years of follow-up, but I hope that in the next four or five years, when we have a 10-year follow-up, X percentage of patients will be free of disease, and that we can say is a cure fraction. But again, that remains to be determined what percentage that would be from the studies we and others are doing right now. So like in chronic myeloid leukemia, it's possible that the newer targeted therapies uh, could lead to a cure fraction. So for people who are not well versed in uh, CLL, can you clarify what do you mean by first, second, and third generation BTK, uh, BTK inhibitors? And also whether there's an advantage of uh, the newer BCL inhibitors over, say, venetoclax? Yeah, so the, the first generation, basically the first drug which came into the market was ibrutinib. It was first studied and it was approved in 2014 for CLL. But ibrutinib, besides inhibiting the BTK, it inhibits some other off-target effects. So then subsequently, the so-called second generation, which are also what are called covalent inhibitors, they, ibrutinib also bind to cysteine 481 residue of BTK by a covalent chemical bond. So the second generation are also covalent inhibitors, namely acalabrutinib and zanubrutinib. They also bind to the same cysteine 481 residue, but they have less off-target effects. And that, I think, leads to less side effects. So the second generation TKIs work the same way as ibrutinib, but they have less, less side, side effects. effects. But they still can, uh, CLL cells can develop resistance Correct. through the same mechanism of mutation. Correct, so the most common mutation is at the cysteine 481 as residue, which occurs in about 60 to 70 percent of patients with ibrutinib, maybe slightly variable number in, with Akala and Zanubrutinib, but the same mechanism of resistance, and thereby, if a patient is failing ibrutinib 
and they're taking a brutinib, they're failing a brutinib, there's no reason to switch to Akala brutinib or Zana brutinib because the mechanical resistance is the same. If you, if you identify a mutation. If, but even if you don't identify a mutation, we think there may be some other mechanism which could be similar. Uh, but if you are intolerant or have a side effect to brutinib, then certainly I think fair okay. to use Akala. So Zana. let's say somebody does develop resistance with or without the mutation. What are the options for these So patients? then there are two options right now. One is you go to the third generation non-covalent pyrtobrutinib, which is FDA approved now. And how pyrtobrutinib works is that it, it still inhibits BTK, but it sits in the pocket of this BTK without attaching itself to the cysteine for it one residue. And therefore it does not need that residue to be present. Even if it's mutated, it does work. And is it more toxic or more effective and potentially less toxic? So, Cross all because there's no head-to-head -head comparison yet of peto versus ibrutinib, though there is a phase three study ongoing right now, peto versus ibrutinib, we'll see how that reads out. But cross all comparison, peto does seem to have lower toxicity profile, especially compared to ibrutinib, and also numerically also compares to zanobrutinib and, and akalabrutinib. So far, the data we have is peto really in patients who have failed ibrutinib or akala or zanobrutinib. And in that situation, it really works in 80% of the patients. So for sure, it has activity for patients who have failed those drugs. So let's talk now about the potentially curative strategies, so the combinations of couplets. And let's focus on the couplets of BTK inhibitors and venetoclax, uh, or the triplets, where you add the CD20 okay. antibody. So I'm aware of the study of the ibrotinib venetoclax um, uh, with the CD20 antibody. Can you tell us about the outcome of this and what are the next studies that you're doing? Sure, so that's a, where practically the field of CLL is now, really a lot of effort is being done. So the first combination was ibrutinib plus venetoclax. So our group, uh, you know, really led the first study work where we did uh, two years of combination with ibrutinib plus venetoclax. We have reported that work and now we're coming up to six years of follow-up. But at five years of follow-up, our PFS was close to 90% with two years of ibrutinib plus vindoclax. Similar work was done by the Captivate study, which is a global study, but they did one year of ibrutinib plus vindoclax. Their five-year PFS is not as high. It's dropping to 60, 70% range. But if your five-year PFS is 90%, why are you saying we could end up curing 20 or 50%, not 80%? Uh, and how important is the duration of therapy in terms of increasing the cure rate? Yeah. Is it like CML where a longer duration in a deep molecular response improves the treatment free remission rate? Yeah, so I think when I say five year PFS is uh, 90%, but there are patients who have had MRD recurrence, which are not in that 90% because they didn't have a bona fide disease progression. If you were to see how many patients are in MRD negative remission still at five year mark, that 90% will be less. So it, uh, I don't know the actual number right now, but it could be in the 60, 70% range. Okay. And then I think extrapolating it to, to 10 year mark, you know, that's what I'm saying. But we don't know, we don't know. So that be. seems to be very promising yeah. that uh, the couplets um, or the triplet would potentially cure a fraction of the denominator of CLL. What are you doing now to improve on that? So, so in our group, you know, we have now moved to the most, uh, most recent uh, triplet we are exploring actually is with the pirtobrutinib. So we have a trial with pirtobrutinib plus venetoclax plus ubinituzumab. It's an investigative initiative trial at our center. We have, we enrolled 40 patients. We had an oral presentation at EHA, as you know, and now we are close to 80 patients enrolled in the study and our total sample size is 120. So we're hoping we'll finish 120 patients by maybe January of next year. But what we showed at EHA meeting is that we are measuring the MGS MRD by clonistic assay, which is the 10 to our minus six sensitivity, both in the blood and bone marrow, which is quite unique because a lot of CLL studies are moving to blood MRD for logistic reasons, but we elected to do both blood and bone marrow at the same day. And what we are seeing is that very high rates of 10 to our minus six negativity. So in the bone marrow and the blood at six months is 10 to our minus six is like 70% or so, and at 12 months, patients who have reached 12 month mark, it's close to 75 to 80%. That's so, amazing. And when we compare CLOS trial to previous studies we have done with I plus, Ibrutin plus VAN, or even Akala Brutinib based studies, which other groups have done, or Zanu Brutinib based studies, I think cross trial comparison numerically, these data are much higher in terms of MRD rates. So the hope is that. 
that will translate into a, it will be a surrogate for a better PFS and maybe a surrogate for a better OS down the line, but again, time will tell. This is amazing. So a lot of hope that CLL will be cured at a higher rate than in the past. What are other things we can look for in the future in the field of uh, BTK inhibitors? I understand there are BTK degraders. What does that mean? And what are the data with the BTK degraders? Yeah, so that I think is a field which is, uh, I, I personally think it's, it's, it's a great strategy for patients with CLL and the early data is looking quite promising. So what the degraders do is that inhibitors they bind to a specific target in the protein and try to inhibit the protein, but the degraders pretty much mop up the entire protein to kind of insane or simplistic terms, and they have 100% degradation of BTK. Now, luckily, we have at least three or four trials which are ongoing. Two have already had their presentation at EHA meeting. Uh, Nurex and Biogene had their oral presentation, uh, had their poster presentation at, at EHA. AbbVie has one and other companies have one. So they are, first of all, oral drugs, so much easier to give, similar to BTK inhibitors. And the early data, their, their response rates are pretty universal. Most of the patients are still on the drug, short follow-up, and they're not seeing the BTK side effects, such as AFib bleeding, which we associate with BTK inhibitors, because they are coming from off-target effects. So I personally think, and again, I think the next one year will clarify the field, but I, I won't be surprised that three, four years down the line, these BTK degraders replace inhibitors as a strategy for CLL. And I think all the companies are looking to move these degraders quickly into the early lines of therapy. And so I think, I personally, I think I'm very excited about the BTK degraders as a field and degraders as a field in general for other indications But as well. you're saying they would replace the BTK inhibitors. Can they be added to the BTK inhibitors or do they work competitively? So it depends on the individual where exactly it binds to the BTK, and I know there are other there are some companies which are looking at this concept of combining a degrader and an inhibitor together as part of a trial. I guess we don't know right now clinically how it will work, but I think theoretically it could be combined as long as they're not binding to the same site of the BTK protein. Thank you very much, Dr. Jane. This uh, was very helpful. I learned a lot from it, and thank you for taking the time to interview on this. Right. Thank you very much.